Did y'all come here today for something? Are you expecting something? I just wanted to see. Father, thank you for who you are. You're so good that I actually need less of me and more of you. You're so good that I need to decrease. And you need to increase. So would you do that now? Would you create in us thankful hearts that live thankful lives because of who you are? We trust you. Help us to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. In Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul and his partner Silas found themselves in prison. They had cast a demon out of a psychic woman. I hear y'all whispering, we're not in Acts chapter 16. Just giving you some context. Hold your horses. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, Paul is doing ministry with Silas, and as they're doing ministry, there's a woman who's following them. She's bothering them. This woman is a psychic. She's a fortune teller, and the scripture tells us she got her ability to, to tell the future from a demon. So this woman is possessed by a demon. And after days of bothering Paul and Silas, Paul turns around to this woman and says, demon, leave her now in the name of Jesus. And the demon left. The only problem was this woman was a slave. So that means whatever money she made from being a psychic went to her owners. So when, when her owners heard that Paul and Silas cast the demon out, they realized they lost their profit. So they were upset. So they had Paul and Silas beaten and thrown into prison. Are y'all awake? If you're hearing what I'm saying, you should be asking yourself, so God, you mean to tell me that Paul Set, set a woman free and he ended up in captivity. He, he, he did what you asked him to do, what you gave him the ability to do and he got locked up. How does that work? How does that make sense? How is that fair? You would think that Paul would be in prison pouting. God, I, I did this for you and this this what I get. Serving you and this is what I get. 
when I was reading the scripture, I'm thinking Paul must, he got to be upset. He's got to be mad at God. But then I kept reading and the next thing we see Paul doing is not pouting, but praying. Him and Silas are in the prison praying and worshiping. And as they worship, all of a sudden, the ground started to shake. And the prison doors started to rattle. And the chains that were on their hands and feet started to loosen. It's almost like Paul understood that the same God of the church house is the God of the jailhouse. God caused an earthquake. They were in prison. God caused an earthquake and, 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 and the doors opened and, and they walked out of the doors. But then the next thing we see in Acts chapter 16 is that the prison guard woke up. Now, hold on. There was an earthquake. But he woke up after the earthquake. That sounds like another miracle. This man slept through an earthquake. Maybe this earthquake wasn't an accident. So this guard woke up from his nap and he saw the prisoners out, out of their cell. But then he was confused because they didn't escape. They didn't run away. Why are they still here? The guard was so devastated that he hadn't done his job. He was so devastated that he went to kill himself. And right in that moment, Paul stopped him. Paul said, wait, don't do it. Then the next thing we see in scripture is that the guard fell to his knees and he asked Paul the question, what must I do to be saved? You can't make this up. He got saved. Paul led him to Christ. Paul understood if God can move out there, he can move in here. I'm in an unfavorable situation. Seems unfair, seems undeserving. I don't understand why, but I know who. I remember somebody. So he worshiped him. The reason I'm giving you this context is because shortly after Paul got out of this prison, he planted a church in a town called Thessalonica. Planted a church there. And that leads us to our text today. This church in this town called Thessalonica was experiencing some hardship. Paul had experienced hardship when he was there. He was intensely persecuted. And so he wrote 1 Thessalonians months after he planted the church and he desperately wanted to hear an update about what was going on because he knew about the persecution they were facing. But then he also received word that they had some internal problems. They were wrestling with some doctrine. What happens to those who die? Do they miss the second coming? Do they miss the rapture? So they fell into depression. They fell into sadness for those who had died. Maybe they're just lost. What's going to happen to them? Are they just stuck? They're going to miss Jesus. And so Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to encourage them. 
He, he wrote to people who were discouraged. He wrote to people who had problems on the outside and on the inside. So if that's who he wrote to, I need to ask you, do you have some problems? Do you have some problems on the outside and on the inside? Because if you do, listen up. This applies to you. There's problems. So what does Paul say to these people with these problems on the outside and on the inside? They're surrounded by trouble. What does he say? Paul says to them in verse 16, I want you to rejoice always. I want you to pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's what you want them to do? I mean, they're going through it. All they see is problems, and you want them to rejoice. And not only do you want them to rejoice, but you want them to do it always. And then you want them to pray, and then you want them to pray without ceasing. And then you want them to give thanks, and you want them to give thanks in all circumstances. These are the three commands. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Notice how all the things Paul commands them to do, he's already walked through himself. That's why I gave you the context. So you can see he just went through that. So he's not telling them, here's some good tips on how to survive hard times. Here's five ways to find your freedom. No, he said, um, I was in a situation where it looked like I was defeated. And I did some things because I know a man. Because of who he is. And this right here brought me to you. Matter of fact, church, Thessalonian church, you're here today because I prayed in the fire. I endured some suffering and birthed you. The spirit empowered me to plant this church through suffering. So because of that, I'm just telling you the reason why you're here. I'm just telling you how you got here. Here's how you got here. Uh, you rejoiced always. And you prayed without ceasing. And you give thanks in all circumstances. Reason I like that Paul had to walk through the pain and the struggle before he gave them the teaching is because we live in a world where everybody want to be the teacher and nobody wants to be the student. And so we just talk. And we just give out of our abundance of knowledge. But God is saying he's looking for students. Paul was a student. In order for him to teach, he had to first learn. And so as Christians, here's what I want us to do, because You've acknowledged that you may have problems around you and you have problems in you. And so you, if you acknowledge that, that means this text applies to you. And so, believer, church, we must commit ourselves to talk as we walk. Talk as you walk with him. In other words, he don't want your words if they don't come with worship. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at each command. We're going to look at rejoice. We're going to look at 
pray. We're going to look at give thanks. And we're going to ask and answer three questions of each command. We're going to ask what, how, and why. What, how, and why. So our first command, verse 16, rejoice. Rejoice always. So here's our first question. If we are to rejoice always, then what is joy? If you're taking notes, write this. Joy is a deep contentment in the Lord that comes from placing our hope in who he is. It's a deep contentment in the Lord that comes from placing our hope in who he is. The Greek word for joy literally means to be glad. We sang it earlier. That's why in the song it says, e e even, even when I'm shaken, I have joy and chaos. I've never been more glad. Joy. But what is there to be glad about when you're suffering? Why should I be glad in prison? This is where we need to examine what I call the anatomy of joy. The anatomy of joy. See, joy comes from hope. Your joy is tied to your hope. So if you don't have joy, you don't have hope. If you do have joy, you got hope. Now the question is, hope in what? Or rather, hope in who? Hope in who he is. Well, if, if we're supposed to have joy and joy comes from hope and hope comes from who he is, then who is he? Maybe that's why Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? See, because who you believe he is will dictate how you move in the suffering. If you fold in the suffering, it's because you don't know who he is. You don't believe in who he is. You don't hope in who he is. You're not putting your hope in who he is. So there's a very important question. Who is he? To me. Because can I encourage y'all? He's sovereign. If you need help, who is he? He's sovereign. Who is he? He's in control. Who is he? He's alive. Who is he? He's all powerful. Who is he? He knows all. Who is he? He's omnipresent. Who is he? He's the great I am. The one who was and is and is to come. That means he stretches. He covers all of this mess. He fills in the gaps. He fills voids. He's a way maker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. Somebody's awake. He's alive. Maybe you're like me and you need stuff to be explained thoroughly for you to really believe it. I have to examine stuff from all sides sometimes because it sounds good. He's alive. But what does that mean? What does that mean to me that he's alive? The fact that he's alive means he's available. OK, so if he's if he has control, if he has all authority, he's sovereign. OK, he's sovereign, but he's alive. That means all of his control is available. All of his power is available. He makes himself available to you and to me. He's available. He's sovereign and he's alive. He's available. I think that's a reason to rejoice. I think that's a reason that we can celebrate 
we can be glad even in suffering. He's available to me. God, you didn't remove yourself when stuff got hard. Everybody else left and I looked around and, huh, all I have left is the savior of the world. That's all. Just him. It's just me and um, the creator. Oh, you oh, you here. Oh, OK. I like my odds. I'll take that. Just me and you, I'll take that. Write this down. Joy transcends trials and triumphs. It transcends the good and the bad. Joy is persistent. Even in suffering. Maybe I can say it this way. Joy transforms our anxiety into expectancy. See, anxiety is about what you can and can't do. I can't control the future. I can't see what's coming. I'm confused right now. I don't know how I'm going to navigate tomorrow. But joy comes in and it creates this expectancy. I know, okay, I, I can't. That's true. That doesn't change. But, 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 but now with this joy, I can see that even though I can't over here, on the other side, he can. He can. And by the way, he will. And he does. She in my notes. He can and he will. That's what I love about God. He has the ability and he shows the ability. He exercises his power. He exercises his grace in your life. Because he's available to you. He's available to you. To little old me, he's available. I have access to him. He shares what he has with me. He can turn my anxiety into expectancy. Now, instead of worrying, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you to move. I won't sit and worry. I'll sit and wait. I'll sit and expect. I'll sit and believe. You're going to move. And by the way, the way he moves may not be what you thought. So uh, let's not convince ourselves that uh, we can just talk our way into the blessings we want. They got to align with him now. With who he is. Back to who he is. So we've established what joy is. Our next question is, well, how do we rejoice? Joy, if joy is this deep contentment in who he is, how do we rejoice? We rejoice by always remembering who he is and what he does. Who he is and what he does. This is really important because Satan's goal is to get all of us to forget who he is and what he does, especially in the suffering. Because if he can forget us, get us to forget who God is, he can get us to stop relying on him. Now we're looking somewhere else. Now we're trying to fix it. Now we're trying to move. How can I make this work? And in trying to make it work, you're becoming more anxious. And in your anxiety, you're becoming depressed. And there's a cycle of sin that is now formed that can only be broken by trust. And who he is? Faith. It's faith. So we got to remember who he is. So can I ask you a question? What's standing in the way of your joy? What's stopping you from rejoicing right now? Even in the suffering. Especially in the suffering. What's stopping you? Is it a failing marriage? Is it addiction? Is it anxiety? Is it depression? What is it? Is it loss? Is it mourning? What's stopping you from rejoicing? Maybe we need to ask this. What's stopping God from being good? 
What is God allowing to stand in the way of his goodness? I think we know the answer. Nothing. His goodness is unstoppable. It's unshakable. He's unchanging. So if he's always good, I can always rejoice because of who he is. Paul said in Romans 5, he said, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We glory in our suffering. Why? Because we know suffering produces. Let's pause there. Isn't that an oxymoron? (laughs) Suffering produces. Loss, depression produces. Anxiety produces. How does that work? God uses our hell and turns it into our help. In other words, he wastes nothing. So guess what? Your pain that you're feeling right now, it's useful to him. The suffering you're enduring right now, he can use that. So bring it to him. He produces, he produces, he's persevering you. He's giving you a deep sense of who he is. Watch this. He's using your hell to make you look more like heaven. For those that believe, he's using your darkness to bring light. He's producing even in that. That's what he does. We had a praise break last service because I paused in this moment and I'm going to do it again. And I'm just going to say this. He did it in my life. He did it in my life. Matter of fact, he's doing it right now because I shouldn't be up here. He's producing all of the suffering I've gone through. He's shown me some purpose in it. Yeah, there's a purpose in your pain. So we can rejoice always. When I looked like trash, when I smelled like junk, he didn't throw me away. He didn't even think about it. He didn't even consider it. He said, I can use that. You're useful to me. The stuff you were so confused about, watch what I do with it. The stuff that that you couldn't understand, watch how I move it. It's almost like he works all things. I mean, all things. I mean, all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. If he works all things, that means wherever I'm at, wherever I am on the spectrum, where am I? Ask yourself, where am I right now? Am I a little more sad than I am happy? He can use it. Am I a little anxious right now? He can use it. So where are you? Locate the father. Find him. Find him in the suffering. He's all over it. He's all over it. He's there so we can rejoice. This leads us to our last question. Why? Why rejoice? Why? Why do we rejoice in suffering? It doesn't make sense to me. Why do we do this? We do it because everything we'll ever experience is meant to make us more like Christ. Everything. Everything. For those of us who put our faith in him, everything we'll experience is just meant to make us more like him. He's using that. He's producing something in you to make you look more like him. Some of us wouldn't look nothing like Jesus if it wasn't for suffering. I know I wouldn't. 
If I didn't go through hardship, I wouldn't be here. I'm preaching because of suffering. Because he produced something in me when it went, as the kids say, in the mud. He uses the mud and makes something good. And check this out. You give him the junk, and now all of a sudden you get the junk back, and it don't look like what it looked like. Now the junk is better. It's a whole new creation. There's a whole new life out of nothing. From worthlessness to holiness. That's what he does. He makes all things new. All he does is produce. You know, another reason there is to, to rejoice, for those of us that believe, the reason we should rejoice is because um, if you don't know Jesus, your hell becomes your home. So guess what that means? If you don't know him, the stuff you're experiencing now, you can expect more of the same. If you won't accept Jesus, you can expect it to get worse. Oh, it's going to get worse. It's going to get better. And for those that believe, it's going to get gooder. He redeems. This is why we rejoice. Let's keep moving. In verse 17, he moves from from, from commanding them to rejoice. And then he says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Paul, these are some interesting instructions for people suffering. Pray without ceasing. So what is prayer? We know this. Prayer is a conversation with God. It may be thanksgiving. It may be worship. It may be supplication, making requests, pleading with God. Worshiping God, thanking God. That's what prayer is. So we know what prayer is, but do we know how to pray? That's our next question. But how do we pray? I don't know what you've been told, but Paul said pray persistently. That's all he said. I'm sure you were expecting some fancy formula. He said Here's how I want you to pray. Go. (laughs) Do it. And when you do it, do it some more. And after that, do it again. Continue. Pray without ceasing. Paul is not, he, he, when he says pray without ceasing, he's not literally saying we should walk around all day mumbling. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying, he's talking about a mental attitude. He's talking about a posture of prayer, a spirit of prayer. It's almost like this constant awareness that we need him. It's like when you're just going to work and and, and it's a beautiful day outside and nothing's wrong and you're feeling good. But I need you. I do need you today. Even in the good times, I need you. Even when I can't see what's going wrong, I need you. I can't see the storm that's coming, but I do need you. So I'm going to pray. Thank you. So let's employ a new mindset when it comes to prayer. Let's do this. Faith over formula. Faith over formula. Here's what I mean by that. If you're suffering right now, if you're struggling, all you may have is God help me. God, I don't get it. God, I'm upset. God, I'm confused. God, I'm struggling. God, I'm mad at you. But pray. Keep praying. It's fascinating to me how somehow the church has convinced people that asking God questions always upsets him. Then you you get in the Bible and it's just a bunch of people asking questions. And he was right there. Asking questions. So ask. Pray persistently, without ceasing.
Here's why we pray. This may be my favorite point. We talked about how to pray. We pray persistently. But why we pray? We pray because of this. This is my second point. My predicament shouldn't stop my praise. It should intensify it. Your predicament should not stop your praise. It should in intensify it. This is why we pray. When I was a kid, one of my favorite movies was the Transformers franchise. Now, I would say the first three. They kind of fell off after that. But when I was a kid, I loved Transformers. And to be honest, my wife will tell you I still love it. Something nostalgic about it. I remember in one of the movies in particular, the leader of the Autobots, that's the good guys, Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime, in one of these movies, he was protecting the main character, Sam, and he died. Um, an 11-year-old me didn't know what to do. I was in the theater stressed. So Optimus is gone, so I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can go to school tomorrow. <laughs> I think I need to spend some time. Optimus is gone. So I was confused. But what's interesting is now that I've seen the movie a few times, the scene that used to make me sad now makes me excited. Y'all don't hear me. If PK was up here right now, he would. There we go. Your enthusiasm is overwhelming. Me. The scene that used to make me sad is exciting now. It's the best part. The suffering was the best part of the movie. The darkest part was the best part. Old school pastors would say it this way. In the suffering, in the darkness, when you're confused, when you don't know where to turn, when you get the bad doctor's report, Go home and flip to the end of the book. <laughs> and when you get to the end, you'll see that he wins. He wins. We know the end of this story. I know the end of my story. I know now when Optimus died, it was just a setback for the victory. Sound like a prosperity preacher. It's a setback for your comeback. But it's in the text. For those that love him, that's what it means. He works all things. So you know the end of your story. So guess what? If you're down right now, if you're struggling, if, 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 if you're struggling to believe, if you can't hold on, go ahead and cheat. Flip to the end. Okay, so I can go see how to, this is going to end real quick. Because this marriage is, I, I'm losing my mind a little bit. These kids, oh, victory. Oh, and then um, the victory belongs to him. Wait a minute. The victory belongs to him, and I belong to him. So if I belong to him and the victory belongs to him, I think we just going to get together and have a victory party because the victory is mine too. He shared it with me. I got something to hold on to when it gets shaky. When it gets dark, I got some hope I can lean on. The victory is ours. For those that believe, we know the end of the story. When this stuff gets cracking for real, we win. We win. So walk in victory. You walk in victory by praying 
without ceasing. Why shouldn't you stop? Because he don't stop. I thought I told you that we don't. When the hard times hit, maybe we need to ask ourselves, um, did Jesus, Jesus, did you change your mind about me? Did you run out of grace? Did you decide you didn't want to be God anymore? Are you, God, Jesus, are you losing steam? Are you getting tired? Because if the answer is no, then why are we? Why are we? He's not a part-time God. So why are we giving him part-time praise? If he's good all the time, we should pray all the time. A posture of prayer, even in suffering, because suffering produces. He's doing something. We can't see it. We don't know. It's confusing, but that's the point. We're limited. He's not. He's not. That's what faith is. Nobody in this room can verify with full guarantee that the chair you're sitting in is going to hold you up. But you're sitting there. You didn't inspect it before you sat down. You trusted. You, you plopped all the way down. You didn't know what was going to happen. Jesus is saying, if you just have the faith that you have in that chair, in me, you'll be okay. I need to say this because I think this is, it spoke to me, and this may be for somebody here. Stop letting your guilt keep you from embracing his grace. Maybe that's why we don't pray without ceasing. Because we, we get stuck in guilt, and then we sit, and then we stay, and then we feel shame. But God is like, no, that's not it. My grace is the prescription for the guilt. That's why the grace is there, because we're guilty. So I'm not telling you to dust yourself off and say, okay, I'm not guilty. I don't do anything wrong. No, you still are. There's just a place you can take the guilt. Because it's almost like somebody covered it. His grace is sufficient. So don't let that stop you. Give him your guilt. He'll give you his grace. So this leads us to our last command. He's, he's commanded us to rejoice always and to pray without ceasing. And the last thing he commands us to do is to give thanks. It's a third and final command. So what is Thanksgiving? Is it a holiday or a lifestyle? Here's what Thanksgiving is. Thanksgiving is our genuine response to a sovereign and living God. That's what Thanksgiving is. Our response to who he is. It's Thanksgiving. All of our rejoicing and all of our praying comes from our thankfulness. Our thankfulness comes from knowing who he is, from remembering who he is. This is why we're thankful. And so if this is what thankfulness is, then, then how do we give thanks? So our second question, how do we give thanks it's so my third and final point. Thanksgiving requires more than just my lips. It requires my life. It requires my life. This is how we give thanks with our life. This is, what, this is what Paul is calling us to in the text. 
He's calling us to a life of thanksgiving. It's more than a meal and high blood pressure. Because I had some dressing and I was like, I better sit down. My wife threw down, y'all. Thanksgiving, it's not a season, it's a posture. It's a posture of thanksgiving. So, this leads us to our why. Why give thanks? Why give thanks? Well, our why comes from our who? Jesus. Your why comes from your who. The reason you can do this is because of who he is. Because of Jesus. Now, I think we all saw that coming. He is like the main character. It's a Sunday school answer, right? We know the name. But my question is, do you know the nature? You might know the name, but you need to know the nature of the name. In other words, what comes to mind when you think of Jesus? When you hear Jesus, what comes to mind? Is it sovereign ruler? Is it holy? King of all creation? Because that's the nature. His name should remind you of his nature. So we give thanks because of who he is. We got to know who he is, y'all. We can't do this. We can't pray without ceasing. We can't rejoice always. We need him. So who is he? Is he reliable? Is he faithful? Is he powerful? Is he able? If he's able, then we can give thanks. I feel like there might be somebody in here who's hearing this message as, um, okay, so I guess my takeaway is I got to do a bunch of religious rituals. I got to be more on point. I got to pray more, and I got to just be happy somehow, and then I got to give thanks even when I don't want to. Got it. And then I guess at the end of that, I'm going to be okay, and, and, and it'll be cool. But can I say this to you? We're called to more than right than than uh than 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 religious rituals. We're called to righteous living. Not just rituals. Righteous living. All the time. For an all the time God. Well, that leaves an issue. Because if we're called to all the time righteous living, um, we don't meet that standard. The believer, you don't meet the standard. The non-believer, you don't meet the standard. We all fall short. This is what we're called to, but we can't do it. So... What should we do about that? How should we fix that? Maybe some of you have tried. Five ways to fix your life. Three ways to heal your marriage. Maybe you've walked that path and you've seen it didn't lead me where I was trying to go. So what's the answer? How do we how do we deal with the gap of this 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 standard that we can't live up to? God, there's a problem. God, it seems like you're way over there and I'm way over here. I don't know how I can get over there. 
I'm struggling to pray once a week. You want me to pray without ceasing? You want me to have a heart posture of prayer? God, I'm struggling to be thankful for all the stuff I have in the good times, let alone the bad. I can't, I can't do this. God is saying, now we're on to something. You can't. You can't do it. That's the first step. Acceptance. We can't. We can't do it. The reason we can't do it is because it was a job tailor made for him. See, a gap that wide, only a savior, only the savior can fill that gap. And so what he decided to do to fill that gap is he stepped down from heaven. And he stretched himself out after living a perfect life. And he died to fill the void. He died to make a way. He died to be a bridge. And so because of his death and because of the fact that he got up, the fact that victory belongs to him, that means it belongs to us. And if we have the power that he has, we can. We can do all things through him. Things he's called us to. By the way, that's not just a cute quote for a basketball game. It's even in our suffering. We can endure because of him. Because he endured. He endured. He suffered. But he suffered for us. And he won. Then he told us about it. Then he shared it with us. And then he kept sharing it with us. Then he kept on being good. And so if God don't stop, why should we? Why should we? This is why we come to church every Sunday. He woke, he woke us up. He didn't stop being good, so I got to praise him. I got a reason to lift my hands. I have breath in my lungs. I may not like my situation, but I'm here. I have another opportunity to lean on him. He's available to me. So church, have you put your faith in him? Have you trusted in his sovereignty? Because if you haven't, the hell you're experiencing is going to be your home. And so this is why now we give you this opportunity to come. So would you come? Listen, your freedom, your salvation is more important than being concerned about what people think about you. You got to let that go. I got to get saved. I got to be set free. I've been in bondage for too long. I've been suffering for way too long. I think today is the day. Today is the day for me to accept his grace. To be free. So if you don't know him, would you come? Would you come? This is the reason why we do this. It's all to respond to him. That's what this whole thing is about. There's another group I want to offer an invitation to. Those that believe. If you believe but you know you need to repent, would you come? You know you haven't relied on him. You've tried to find your own way. You've been drowning in anxiety. Would you come? Would you allow him to show you what he can do with your suffering? Would you come? We're going to sing one more song. There's a man who I think he works here. 
He's going to lead us in worship. And what we're going to do in this time is let you know the altar's open. Please don't leave here without coming. If he's calling you, respond. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. You've eaten. God blessed you with all of that food that you ate. He gave it to you. We have reason to give him thanks. So don't let me sing along. This is all a part of his message still. We're just worshiping God. Tell him, say, I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we've won. I could go on and on and on about your words because I'm grateful, grateful, so grateful just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart is gratefulness. Let's sing that one more time. Forget about the person around you. Go and give him some praise. Talk to him. Hey, did he wake you up this morning? Did he put food on your table? Then open up your mouth and say, I am. I'm grateful for the things that you have done.
dare you? Think about how good he been to you. Y'all busy looking at me, but he woke everybody in here up today. Everybody. <laughs> I dare you, just, th just think of three things he's done for you just this week. Has he paid any bills in the house? Has he kept your kids alive? Has he kept your marriage together? So we bless you. Yeah. We magnify you. We say hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Cause you're good, cause you're good. You're so good, you're so good, you're so good, you're so good. Nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. We search high and low. But we still couldn't find So we come here today To lift our hands To bless your name With hearts filled with I'm grateful for Eric. As you leave this place, don't let your gratefulness leave. Don't let your thanksgiving leave. I dare you to just keep blessing him with the fruit of your lips. Have a great week. Come on back next week. We will see you then.